Hello, I'm Rob Califf. I want to welcome you to another episode of The Life and Times of Famous Cardiologists. It's great to be here with Marty Leon today. As you know, um, this is a series that I uh, do because I think it's so much fun to hear about people who have done great things in cardiology. And for the audience, the feedback I, I get is that the inspiration that comes from understanding why they do what they do and what they see for the future is very meaningful to a lot of people. There's hardly anyone who's influenced more cardiologists than Marty Leon. So, Marty, welcome. Thank you, Rob. It's really a pleasure. So, let's start by just hearing a little bit about where you came from. Where, where, where were you born and what were your parents doing? I was born in uh, New York City. I was born in Brooklyn to a very humble, middle-class Jewish family. My father was an accountant, later became an appellate conferee. My, my mother was a, um, a housekeeper. Um, and. Um, she, uh, at least for me, was a you know, very strong motivating force, um, but a uh, very humble um, f family life and uh, went to public schools in New York. Uh, very, very education oriented. Not so much career oriented, but education oriented. That seems to be a common thread in people that I've interviewed who have done you know, great things like you. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I had uh, two brothers. One died when I was a child. My uh, younger brother is uh, currently actually at the University of Michigan. He's a clinical psychologist who teaches, writes, and practices. What happened to your other brother? Um, I had an older brother who became ill when, when he was uh, very young. He had severe peptic ulcer disease. Actually died at the age of nine. I was six at the time. And that was a very um, telling episode for me at the age of six. It's hard to understand or resolve some of these major family issues, but the devastating impact that had on my family uh, had a, a significant impression on me. And at that point, I realized that uh, the ability to be able to help people who were sick was very powerful. And I made the bold statement at the age of six that I was going to be a doctor. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> kind of early. Did your teachers believe it? I don't think anybody believed it. <laughs> And, and your parents, um, they were education oriented, and I suspect that was common in the culture, cultural environment that you were in. Did, did they uh, foster the idea of being a doctor, or did, was it really just sort of they wanted you to get educated and didn't want to push you one direction or another? No, they really didn't push me towards medicine. Um, at that time in New York, <coughs> um, mm -hmm. if you were kind of a middle class Jewish kid trying to achieve, then medicine and law were the two professions you thought about. Um, and uh, it was, it was m mostly self-directed uh, and uh, self-motivated. My parents really didn't push me in any direction. They were a little bit intimidated about the idea of me being a physician, thinking that, in fact, it was too hard, too much work, and too much self-sacrifice. So as you went through um, junior high and high school, what did you do for fun? Oh, I love sports. I mean, my other dream was to be a center fielder for the New York Yankees. So I was a, I, I was a actively participating in sports uh, at, at all levels, and that was my other great passion. What was your crowning achievement in sports? <laughs> um, I was a runner, and actually uh, it was difficult in New York. There are so many kids around, and uh, so I had achieved some significant athletic prowess um, running the 100-meter dash. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. You know, I, I, I've told a lot of people, I was captain of a high school state championship basketball team, and I've mm -hmm. never done anything since that sort of <laughs> matched that uh, crowning <laughs> glory. And I, but, but that's a great thing about sports. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you see an analogy between your love of sports and things that have happened to you in Madison? Ab absolutely. I think it's a combination of the idea of being part of a team, the idea of personal achievement, self-sacrifice, the discipline required, the training. I think that there are so many parallels that I really do um, um, find my, my participation and love of sports that have carried over to many of my professional um, Another aspect that, that I think is important in sports, and I'm interested in your um, view on this, the concept that you can lose, and then you wake up the next morning and you look forward to the next game. Isn't that, particularly in a high-risk special like you chose to go into, um, you have defeats along the way, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I think you're right. I think that the analogy is very telling. Um, especially in, in, in my sub-sub-specialty, we take care of a, of a lot of sick patients, and you don't always have successes. Uh, and to learn how to cope with those emotionally and intellectually, I think, is important. And it's not so dissimilar to losing in a major sport event and having to come back and be able to regroup and, and also to be self-critical and to figure out what you, can, what you can do better next time. Now, now, you're a leader who's inspired a lot of people. Were you a leader in high school? 
No, I never thought of myself as a leader. I'll be perfectly honest, I, I'm, uh, I don't think of myself as a leader. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit um, uh, um, intimidated by the idea that people view me in that light. Um, I'd rather just continue to do what I do and you know, hopefully um, have an impact, but um, being a leader is, uh, uh, is, is not something that I ever thought about. So you finished high school, and where'd you go to college? Went to college at a state university in New York, uh, um, uh, um, uh, in Stony Brook, um, and uh, was uh, very determined, was pre-med, and uh, from there went to Yale Medical School. Did you have a mentor in college who uh, helped you with your determination? Um, uh, I did. I had uh, um, a biochemist, a uh, young biochemist, and uh, I um, did a lot of work with him. Um, interestingly, um, on in basic science, and uh, really enjoyed the idea of, uh, of 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 diving deeply into a field uh, and trying to, if not invent, certainly discover new things. Um, so that was very powerful for me. Is he still around? Um, uh, I'm sure that he is, but we haven't connected for several decades. Was Yale your first choice? Um, Yale was definitely my first choice. Yeah. Why? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I visited the campus and I fell in love with him. My brother at the time was an undergraduate at Yale. The idea of being connected to him was, was attractive. Um, I liked the idea because Yale at that time required a thesis as part of your MD degree. And I liked the idea of being uh, in a situation where um, I was challenged to do original research as part of my my uh, MD. They also emphasized very early exposure to clinical medicine. After your first year, you had to do clinical rotations just to get exposed to being a clinical physician. And uh, those two factors were very um, important to me. What did you do your thesis on? It was in cardiology. My thesis advisor was uh, Lawrence Cohn, uh, who was chief of cardiology. We called him Little Larry. He's still around as a dean at Yale, an extraordinary guy. Uh, and it had to do with non-invasive assessment of LV function. Oh, that's interesting. So it was non-invasive. I like that. Oh, no, no. No, in fact, invasion came later. Um, I went to the NIH. I became interested in cardiovascular pharmacology uh, and nuclear cardiology at that time. So I was very much a non-invasive cardiologist in the early days. And so you finished uh, medical school and then, of course, on to internship. Was there any thought of diverting from the straight course, or did you just go right on through? No. Um, uh, it, it was it was pretty regimented. You get influenced by certain things, of course. Um, uh, my family was very maternally oriented, and my grandmother was a revered figure um, and was very important in our family. And she died of an acute MI when I was 18. She literally died in my arms as we were taking her to the emergency room. Um, and that sparked my interest in cardiology. So even by the time I went into medical school, I had uh, a, a significant interest in seeing if, uh, if cardiology would be an interesting subspecialty. So I gravitated in that direction. Um, I, I was interested in academic medicine, or at least wanting to try to see if I could be any good. Uh, and I was told at that time that the way to go was to go to the NIH. So that's where I went. After residency? Then. After residency, yeah. And you went to NIH for a fellowship? I went there to be a clinical associate. So you'd already done a fellowship? Had done, had done internship, residency. Was all was, that at Yale? Well, at Yale, and, and uh, um, I did uh, um, a, a, a fellowship. They called it a, clini a clinical associateship um, within NHLBI. That was just when Brownwald had left and when Steve Epstein had taken over to be chief of the division. And again, I became interested in cardiovascular pharmacology, did early work with calcium channel blockers and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, did some interesting work in um, uh, nuclear cardiology. Bob Bonner was there. He was a very close friend. So we were discovering new things about how to assess LV function non-invasively with some brilliant engineers. And that was very exciting. I had a chance to write some papers. I um, enjoyed the idea. I, uh, uh, in college, one of my, my co-majors was uh, English literature. So I enjoyed writing. And that gave me a chance to express that. A lot of, a lot of people in Madison can't write, can they? Have you oh, noticed that? Oh, God. It's, 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 uh, it's staggering to me how few people can actually um, write coherently and write easily. Um, uh, I think part of it is natural, but part of it also is like anything else. I think you have to put the time and the effort to write well. So 
I think a lot of people who know you well understand the trajectory that you went on, but it, it probably to people who don't know you well, it's surprising to them to hear that you are sort of in a traditional academic mode and at the NIH, which you know these days is sort of the epitome of real academia because you get paid nothing and you're there because you're interested in learning. There's not um, all the accoutrements even mm -hmm. of a university where you may have salary bonuses and nice offices and you know all that sort of stuff. It's a federal establishment. Did, did, did you feel right at home there? Was, what, what was it like? I was excited to be part of something that was um, much bigger than anything that I had been exposed to. Um, when you're kind of walking the floors where Brownwald and Sonnenblick and Ross, all, all these giants walked, I think that there is a sense um, uh, of the history of the place and that resonated with me. Uh, I enjoyed having access to many things that I couldn't have at a university. I learned um, some experimental biology. I learned animal physiology. I worked in animal laboratories. Uh, later on, I had a chance to work with biomedical engineers in, in areas that I couldn't have dreamed to work in in a university. So the exposure was terrific. You're right. It was difficult um, because you don't get paid very much. I was a section chief, director of the cath lab, was there for a total of nine years. And at the age of 39, when I left, my salary was just peaking over fifty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> Hard for people to imagine now, uh, isn't yeah. it? And were you uh, developing your own family then? I haven't really ever yeah. known you from the perspective of your family life, so this this is new information for me. Yeah, I had a wife and two kids, and then I think we collectively decided that for me to be a responsible uh, um, uh, um, uh, father and uh, breadwinner, that uh, um, uh, that I had to do something a little bit. Uh, um, different than stay at the NIH uh, indefinitely. Plus, the, I had somewhat un outgrown the NIH. Some of my interests had, had developed in a direction that required that I have a larger clinical environment to work in, and the NIH was somewhat restrictive in that regard. So was there a moment when you decided to become an interventional cardiologist? Yeah, I, re I remember it well. It actually, several moments, these, these epiphanies, these existential moments. I took care, I, I, I worked with Kenny Kent, who di who's the third person in the United States to do balloon angioplasty. And I was the clinical associate taking care of his patients. And to be perfectly honest, I, I found the experience to be very distressing um, because uh, we failed. We had primary failures in about a third of the cases. We had uh, a lot of patients that ended up going back to the operating room for abrupt closure, and we had restenosis. And if, if we were really being honest, in as many as 40 to 50 percent of patients. And I boldly proclaim that this has this is no place in, in, in modern medicine. And then in 1982, my mother, who again I had very strong um, uh, maternalistic uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, feelings in my fa in, um, in my family, she developed coronary disease. She was young. She was 63 had unstable angina, was catheterized. Uh, I brought it um, uh, to, to Yale. She was catheterized. And uh, uh, ultimately, um, she had bad three-vessel disease and went to New York to be operated upon uh, because some of the best surgeons were in New York. And she had a very rocky course. And she died 14 days later with multi-system organ failure. And, uh, and that was the existential moment that I said, hey, you know, I got to do this differently. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it's, it's ironically existential, isn't it, that your grandmother and your mother yep. um, uh, in your presence died of the disease that you uh, have exactly. taken on. Yeah. Really, really pretty amazing. So um, how does one make a transition? You know, I, personally, my life was Richard Stack, of course, who was doing mm -hmm. similar things to Kenny Kent. Sure. And I was taking care of it. I, I took a different approach. I knew I wasn't destined to be the interventional guy, and so I sort of regarded the care of the post-intervention and acute patient as sort of an engineering task that required mm -hmm. a lot of things and got interested in that. But it was obvious to all of us that um, the technology was going to improve and it was going to get better. It was the right thing to do. I still remember Dr. Sabison asked me to give a lecture to the surgeons very early on, and I predicted that. Uh, percutaneous intervention would replace a good bit of bypass surgery. I was not asked to give another lecture in <laughs> surgery for five years. It was not a pleasant experience. But something, something made you um, actually invest the time and energy to begin to do the procedures yourself then. Well, I became reinvolved um, literally the year of my mother's death and um, worked very hard to gain some of the skills that were necessary to be an interventionalist. At that time, there were no fellowships. To even call yourself an interventionist was a vague term because there was no certification of what that meant. 
but the NIH did have this tradition with Kenny Kent and then Doug Rosing, and I uh, spent some time with Grunzig, and he was a charismatic person. Um, uh, but I really still believe fundamentally that balloon angioplasty was largely a failed procedure um, and became exposed to some opportunities and had a chance early on, mid-1980s, to work with Julio Palmas in the animal laboratory. Got familiar with what stents looked like, worked with all kinds of crazy atherectomy devices, became involved in intravascular ultrasound, and, f and, and felt that there would be ways that we can improve endoluminal recanalization and make it safer and more definitive. Now, in the midst of all this, this conglomerate came together at the Washington Hospital Center, mm. and uh, there, um, I remember, you know, I was sort of in a different venue, but I was intersecting with all these people, and it was really something to behold. What, what was that like as it all came together? Well, that also was a fascinating experience. Um, having left the NIH, I, I, I enjoyed the Washington area, wanted to stay local, uh, but wanted to continue to pursue a research career. I looked around at academics, and to be honest, there wasn't very much in academic medicine that related to interventional cardiology. In fact, interventionals were frowned upon as being kind of the, the lowest end of the academic spectrum. Um, uh, uh, and I needed to create a, a different model uh, in order to try to do what I wanted to do, which is to do clinical research and to do some basic research to try to see how we could impact the area uh, and to have high patient volume so that we could do clinical research. Um, so when I came, we coalesced basically four cath labs. Um, my experience is from the NIH, and Kenny Kent came from Georgetown, and Lowell Sattler came from Fairfax Hospital, and Gus Bichard at the Washington Hospital Center, four cath lab directors. We formed a group, and I founded at that time the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, which was a not-for-profit research foundation to try to be the vehicle to do some of the clinical research and educational things that I cared about. Uh, and it worked remarkably well. It's just one of those things where, you know, everybody submerged their egos and said we have some larger missions to accomplish, and it was very exciting. It's, it's hard to understand how out of all the efforts to do things like that, you know, this one, as you said, you would have thought, as my wife would say, you would have needed a room without a roof because the egos would be so yep. large you couldn't contain them within the room. And yet, you guys found a way to uh, put it all together and created this really powerful machine. What was, it's like the Beatles. I mean, what, why did the Beatles work? What, what was the magic here? I think there was personal chemistry. I think there was mutual respect. I think that we collectively felt that we could do together much more than any of us could do by ourselves. Um, and it was, uh, it was the halcyon days of coronary intervention. You know, they used to call us cowboys, but we had an opportunity to work with a variety of new techniques but had developed a style where we could um, um, evaluate those new strategies and techniques in a more disciplined way. And everybody bought onto it. Um, uh, and uh, for a period of the better part of a decade, we, uh, just within the Washington Hospital Center and all of our fellows and minions that worked with us, um, uh, we uh, uh, authored over a thousand manuscripts. So I'm going to come back to your views of academia and NIH mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, but um, I, I, we're, I think we're on a roll here in terms of okay. the history of all this. It's really um, fascinating. So you formed the CRF, and then you right. started having a meeting that became yeah. like a cult um, <laughs> revival. You know, my grandfather was a Baptist minister, so I still remember going to revivals um, in, the, in the low country of South Carolina. What, was, what prompted you to start the meeting, and how does it grow to be such an enormous um, thing that impacted cardiology? Well, that also is an interesting history. Um, uh, Grunzig died in 1985, uh, and that was just the beginning of what we call the new device angioplasty era. Stents, atherectomy, lasers, uh, and there was a void. And the, and the legacy of how intervention was taught, the educational process, was born to a certain extent out of the live case demonstration milieu. Uh, to be able to watch people work, understand their technique, have them explain it, had an important impact on educating generations of interventionalists. I felt that things had been lost a bit after his death, and somebody had to kind of pick up the, the um, mantle to a certain extent. Um, I was still at the NIH, it was 1988, the first year that we did uh, a TCT, and I was uh, sitting on, I remember it distinctly, Kenny Kent's back porch, it was after I think uh, 
the uh, um, uh, well the, the, the second six pack of beer, <laughs> and we decided together that um, why don't we try to do something that's a little bit different? Why don't we, in the midst of this new device era, why don't we see if we can put together some of the key faculty and and recreate some of the things that Grunzik had done. And that was the genesis of TCT. The first meeting was at the Omnishurum Hotel. There were 200 people, a faculty of 12. We did six live cases, of which two failed. Uh, <laughs> and it was meant to be a, bo a boutique meeting in the new angioplasty device era. And uh, um, it immediately, uh, the response to it was striking. People seemed to um, uh, feel that, uh, again, we need to regrow the live case educational format and we need to expose these new procedures to an open audience to be able to teach each other if we're going to accelerate the field. It, and grow it did. Boy did it grow. Uh, beyond what anybody's vision could have imagined, uh, somewhere in the 90s we realized that suddenly we had a tiger by the tail and this was going to be really a, you know, a defining educational activity for the interventional community and not just the U.S. This was from the very beginning was a global event. Uh, and it's ironic because the last TCT just last week, 70% of the participants were outside the U.S. So it continued to be a global event. Uh, and we um, morphed it into what we thought was a, a more rounded educational experience that would be a core curriculum for interventionalists. Um, it took a lot of time and it, it took a lot of personal effort. And then when Greg Stone joined us in the late 90s, I think he really helped us carry it to another level. Uh, he has just a huge work ethic and was really committed to the meeting. So in the midst of all this, there's a lot of money involved. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, I want to spend a few minutes here on the intersection with academia and where all this is headed. Um, I, if I had to say one of the things that probably arced the traditional academics as you were, not when you were at the NIH, but as things began to evolve was, these guys make so much money. And they're not, you know, they're not traditional academic. They're doing things with their hands. And uh, there was probably a bit of a bias against what you were doing. What are your reflections on the role of money in all this? You know, that's difficult. We were working in the private sector. Um, and we had set up a PC, a practice. And the practice um, reflected the clinical work that we did. All of the educational things and all of the the other academic activities were really born out of the practice. Um, a CRF from the beginning had always been a 501c3 and nobody ever derived any economic benefit from it. Um, but I can imagine that uh, much like with surgeons who, who uh, have perhaps higher incomes than, than um, their colleagues in university environments, I think there was a disparity between the interventionalist income um, and the um, uh, more traditional um, uh, academic um, income and salary structure. For better or worse, um, in my own personal case, you know, I, uh, um, you know, life is funny. You pay your dues, and uh, I, as, as I said, I left the NIH at the age of 39, and, you know, my, and my exit salary was $52,000. Um, so the idea of being able to help provide financial support for my family was not something that I um, um, viewed in a negative way. So the, this, the um, conglomerate in Washington ran its course and you ended up moving to New York. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give us a little insight into what, uh, what happened there? Well, um, as you said, there was tremendous chemistry in the beginning um, uh, and I think that the, the decade of the 90s was terrific. Um, I had always had in my mind, I grew up in New York and still had family in New York. If I ever had an opportunity to come back to the city, I think that would be great. I would enjoy that. Um, by the same token, I had now a group of junior people who were around me. And in a private sector environment that we had created in Washington, um, it was very difficult for me to be able to retain and to grow those junior colleagues. And I needed a different platform that would allow me to be able to do that. Um, and some opportunities arose in New York that might allow me to do that. And we were able to move CRF and six physicians and start afresh in New York um, in 1999. And that's, you've been happy with that? I've been very excited, particularly since we transitioned to Columbia, which is almost the full circle because, again, that's a very traditional academic environment. Um, um, I was very happy with that um, because it did give me, it, ex it, it brought me back to my historical um, geography that I really enjoyed. 
um, um, and it also gave me an opportunity to extend myself in different directions. So interventional cardiology, at least as I see it, you know, I had the fun of watching all this, mm -hmm. and you know, it, you, you're you're right. I mean, it's like every month there was some great new thing, and it was really exciting. It's become pretty corporatized now, and a lot of people worry that you know the inventiveness that was there is leaving us now. On the other hand, the advances like the percutaneous valves are huge, um, but the sort of gimmicks and gadgets, and the sort of uh, artisanship. I hear people say it's not like it used to be. Is, is that mistaken or is it just a field that's growing up and, and uh, maturing? I think it's part of the maturation and evolution process that some of the early days where everything was new um, and everything was exciting, I, I think that certainly has changed. I think some of the, the um, innovation and coronary intervention has flattened and plateaued. Uh, I think part of it is that with a mature subspecialty, we've gotten fairly good at what we're doing, and the incremental benefits are relatively small. Whether the next drug eluding stent reduces stent thrombosis by what fraction of 1% is, is, is less interesting than it was to develop the first drug eluding stent. Um, and I think that's part of it. I think that's a good part of it. I also think the environment, the economic environment, the practice environment, um, has changed also, so it's become a little bit more um, commoditized, and as you say, I think it's more of a corporate environment, yeah. So I've been given a strange uh, lecture at this uh, meeting entitled Innovation and Regulatory Science, and mm. you know, the, my title slide has changed to, is it an oxymoron? Mm. What, what advice, you know, a lot of people say that the regulatory environment is stifling innovation in, in uh, the U.S. in particular. What, what, how do you feel about that? That's a common theme these days, and I've been at many meetings, and I've um, had an opportunity to give similar lectures, could share some slides with you. Um, uh, and I think things have changed. I, 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 it's too easy to become an FDA basher and say that's the only influence that's made innovation more problematic in the United States, but that certainly is one of them. I think that there is, to a certain extent, uh, a disincentive to move things quickly. And I think it is a, a heavily bureaucratic process, and, uh, and people have to realize that if we're going to grow and we're going to achieve, there actually are some risks we have to take, but those are risks that should be understood and, and accepted, and I think that the FDA right now is fairly risk averse. At the same time, I have great respect, uh, and I applaud a lot of the efforts that they've made. Uh, um, so uh, I have mixed feelings about the FDA's role, but it is more difficult. If you're a physician, you want to be creative, you want to get involved in new things. From a device standpoint, it's simply going to be more difficult for all kinds of reasons, um, um, FDA and, and local U.S. regulation being one of them. I suspect that we share an interest in being good global players and we want the mm -hmm. world to succeed, but I worry about the trajectory of the U.S. right now. And in some ways, um, innovation and product development is a, may, may be a stalking horse for other parts of our society. Are, are you worried or do you think this is all going to work itself out? Uh, I'm absolutely worried and um, I have no assurances that it's going to work itself out. And in fact, if the pendulum continues to swing, I don't think that some of the changes that are happening right now will be easily reversed. Um, so um, w w we were talking a moment ago about the percutaneous valve. We were the 43rd country in the United States to have commercial access to a percutaneous heart valve for severe aortic stenosis. In patients who had no other option, the 42nd was Algeria. Uh, and it begins to put things in some perspective. Um, uh, and um, I think everybody is going to have to wake up and realize that if we import our expertise, uh, and if that becomes the norm, that the United States is suddenly going to become in a very disadvantaged position. In fact, it probably already is. And what would you do about it? Oh, all kinds of things. I think that um, regulatory reform for certain, I think there are things we can do in order to, to balance things more carefully so that patient safety and risk is certainly considered very carefully but give us an opportunity to have earlier access under a variety of circumstances so that we don't feel like there's such a gap between the rest of the world and U.S. I think that the government has taken no responsibility um, for helping to, to shoulder part of the burden of of uh, paying for innovation. Certain countries like Israel 
Um, it is, um, uh, it's extraordinary the, the support they get from, from um, the government to um, assist with the growth of early stage development. Um, and I think right now, um, de certainly development in the device side requires that there be industry partners. Now, for the past decade or more, physicians and others are tainted by virtue of any relationship with injury, uh, with industry. And, and um, um, I think that that partnership, they are the tool makers. And unless we influence that in a positive way and develop the right kinds of relationships that are transparent and open, that allow us to be creative, then those industry partners will go elsewhere. Uh, and we see that happening all of the time. So I think that mi on many fronts, there needs to be important change. As you may know, we're building a university in China right now, or China's building a university for us, I should say. And mm -hmm. you know, I keep telling people the biggest investor in biomedical technology in the next decade is going to be the Chinese government. And I think most people I say that to don't believe it, but Absolutely. It, it's happening. Absolutely. Well, just a couple more questions to finish up. You, you found, uh, it sounds like a very comfortable home, and I agree, one of the most traditional academic places. Lee Goldman's a good friend, the dean of the... <laughs> School of Medicine, we've worked together for years, and it's a great, her part is, uh, he and I great are guy. really good friends, but it's very traditional. I mean, a lot of the routine clinical investigators tell me at Columbia, you can't get tenure unless you're, uh, you know, deep into some kind of molecular biology. You found a reasonable home, but I wonder what your reflections are on academia in general. Um, you describe essentially being frustrated with the receptivity to creativeness of interventional cardiology early on. Has, has academia got it right now? Or, or well, you know, it's a great question. I think academia has to change as well. And, and, um, and Columbia, I think, is a very traditional environment. When we came to Columbia, we came with a very clear understanding that we wanted to try to bring a different culture. Um, and we created an environment and brought the people and had the support of upper level management both at the medical school and at the hospital level to be able to create that environment to prove to people that we could be extremely effective clinicians. We could be good at clinical business development to bring patients into the hospital so that the hospital can be financially um, uh, at rest uh, and also at the same time do high quality academic work. Um, and that, that was the theme and that was the goal. Uh, we haven't quite accomplished everything, but I think that we've certainly uh, helped to demonstrate uh, that we're good citizens of the university and we can accomplish those things. And I think that that model can extend to many other areas uh, in academic medicine and should. I worry, I, I don't know how much of this you do because you have so many other things that you're doing, mm -hmm. but when I make rounds at most academic centers, we're training a lot of specialty fellows who can do the tasks extremely competently. They're really good at what they do. But I worry that they're not being inspired or trained to create new things in the future and think about research as part of what they do. Obviously, you built it right into your practice. Am but, I just a, a guy who's getting yeah. old and can't see the goodness? No, that's no, I feel the same. I, I, I enjoy clinical practice, both in the cath lab. There's a visceral sense when I'm there that I can, that that I'm at peace. Um, uh, so I still. Um, physically enjoy doing procedures and taking care of patients. Uh, I enjoy rounding with house staff. Uh, house staff are brilliant these days. They're fund of knowledge in their, in their um, uptake of information and their clinical skills are really formidable. But as you say, their creativity and their willingness to really extend themselves and to pay their dues. Because to do research, it doesn't come free. I mean, I mean, you have to spend the extra years, the effort, the additional training. I don't see as much of a commitment as uh, I, I saw in uh, um, a generation ago. So uh, somehow we have to be able to um, uh, reinvigorate that aspect of what we do or, or else um, research is gonna um, continue to, it, it, it will certainly continue, but, but the creative aspects of it I think will uh, um, uh, fall. So what do, you, what do you tell young people now when you're making rounds with them and they ask you, you know, what's the golden path to uh, success? Well, you know, most young people, you know, these days in their early stages of house staff training, it's a matter of survival. And they think, but they don't think too critically about what they want uh, in terms of their distant future. I always ask the first day that I start attending, and CCU or, or otherwise, uh, um, uh, I, 
I, I tell people it's important at the end of this rotation for us to talk about what you want to do five and ten years from now. But it's interesting how difficult it is to get people to focus on the future these days. There seem to be so many um, forces that influence professional choices um, that go beyond just the love of research or to have a creative impact on the field. But if you do get them to focus and they say, okay, Dr. Leon, you, you are the man. How, do I, how can I become someone like you in the field I want to? Well, you know, it, it's very difficult to give advice. Um, uh, there's no formula. Uh, what I enjoy most, uh, I still enjoy the educational piece, but we've surrounded ourselves with a lot of young people at Columbia. Uh, and to watch their growth and to be able to lead that group, there I think leadership is important, but it's at a local level. Um, and you lead by example, and uh, if they buy into the culture and you, see, and, and you see people change and their careers blossom, that's a very exciting experience. Anything else you think uh, the viewers ought to see? There are a lot of fellows and all sorts of people. My mother watches this. Uh, <laughs> what, what, should, what should people know either about the future or um, what, what you see uh, coming in medicine or I, personally? I, well, it's hard to predict the future. I, you know, I still have this very strange notion that, uh, you know, since the age of six, that, that you know, medicine is a very noble profession. And I think that people need to continue to reflect on that. Um, I think the, the art and practice of taking care of patients should still be the main focus for people who want to continue to practice clinical medicine. Um, but I think beyond that, you can impact people's lives in many ways. I think it's special to be able to do it on a patient-to-patient -patient basis. It's important to train young physicians because I think you can help mentor and steer their careers in a proper pathway. Uh, it's, it's equally important to be able to educate your peers at meetings like TCT or the AHA um, and to develop new strategies, to lead clinical trials, to develop new ways of thinking uh, and to be creative out of the box in terms of bringing new therapies I think also has an impact. And I think that you know, people have to realize that medicine is such an open platform that they should focus on one or several of those and uh, um, uh, you know, push themselves to the point of taking risks. And that actually has been, at least in my career, a great theme. I, I, I like the idea of trying to reinvent myself and to put myself in uncomfortable situations because I think you can't grow unless you do that. Uh, and the only way to do that is to take risks and to be willing to fail as well. I, I just can't resist. This, this will be the last question. You've mm -hmm. been generous with your time. Um, I, you, you know, we, we also have a medical school in Singapore, as you mm -hmm. know, and I didn't really understand the island mentality. You know, there's so many brilliant people there, mm -hmm. but the risk of failing in Singapore, and, you know, I've had many conversations with our friends in Singapore about this. In the U.S., if you fail, it's sort of people sort of seem to understand it and if you if they don't you can go somewhere else in Singapore you fail and everybody in the country knows it because it's only 26 square miles but and you, if you take a rest you're going to fail sometimes mm -hmm. and, and what, what goes through your mind if you've tried something that didn't work do you just get up the I, next day and start over? Or you... I, I've had so many failures I mean we talked about these early devices S m many more of them didn't work than did and to uh, uh, and even the ones that did, there were s subtleties or fatal flaws that had to be corrected and worked on. So, so it's common for me to confront that. But uh, it's more the Teddy Roosevelt philosophy that if you're going to do it, you should dare greatly. So when I take risks, I want them to be big risks. <laughs> so if I succeed, I can succeed in, a, in an important way. If I fail, I fail. And I'll try to pick myself up and you know, try to go to the next challenge. And I think that is a, a good philosophy. So if, if you can think big, um, I think the failure is less, uh, um, uh, is less disturbing. I think that's wonderful advice. I really appreciate your taking the time. This has been a lot of fun for me, and I'm sure the audience is getting a lot out of it. Thank you, Rob.